The International Energy Agency is at the heart of global dialogue on energy. It aims to help countries provide secure, affordable and sustainable energy. But with rising oil prices, geopolitical uncertainties and climate change, it faces no shortage of challenges. I sat down with the IEA's Executive Director, Fatih Birol, to discuss the agency's most pressing issues. I'm Ali Aslan and this is One on One. Fatih Birol, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for your visit to Paris and to International Energy Agency. Thank you so much. Throughout the world, we are seeing exceptionally high gas prices. As a matter of fact, prices hit the highest level in eight years. Uh, what do you think? What is driving the surge? Is it a classical matter of limited energy supplies and higher demand, or is there more to it? So there are uh, a few reasons uh, why we see such high natural gas prices, especially in Europe. Uh, but two of them are critical. Uh, one of them is after the COVID uh, crisis, when the European economy, global economy, started to recover, it gave a big boost to gas use, gas consumption. Mm -hmm. the, uh, we have uh, seen the industries, the fabrics, and, and so on, have started to run. We have seen the electricity demand to increase. This would mean huge very high level of gas demand growth. This is where. Second, this to meet that demand, of course, you need to get natural gas to Europe. And about 40% of natural gas to Europe uh, comes from Russia. And Russia, while the demand is so high, in fact reduced significantly it is gas deliveries to Europe. Compared to previous years, the normal years, the Russian gas exports to Europe declined by one third. So as a result of that huge demand growth, less uh, gas coming from the main supplier from uh, Russia, we have seen very high natural gas prices in Europe, five, six times compared to the normal averages. And since uh, gas is used widely to produce electricity, this gave also a big boost to electricity prices. So uh, today in uh, Europe, we are seeing record natural gas prices and record electricity uh, prices. And it seems that this may well continue uh, for uh, some uh, months to come. Russia's actions in Eastern Europe have all, has also yeah. prompted uh, Germany to halt the Nord Stream exactly. 2 gas pipeline, of course, which was supposed to transport Russian gas to Germany via the Baltic states. Uh, was that the right decision? I think the Germany has legitimate grants to make this decision. And uh, as you uh, well know, this has been a long discussion between the political parties in Germany, but and also German government and uh, several European uh, governments. And uh, uh, the, the day before yesterday, uh, the uh, Chancellor, the uh, Olaf Scholz, decided to stop uh, for the time being. And uh, I think this is a, a turning point in the relationship of uh, Russia and Germany, which is a historical uh, roots, to be honest with you. And the halting of Nord Stream 2 is something that the Americans have advocated for a very a long time. Yes. Of course, at the end of the day, it's the consumers which are primarily exactly. and negatively exactly. impacted by all of this, by exactly. high energy exactly. bills. Um, exactly. You, the IEA, is, is uh, advising governments yes. on how to provide affordable uh, energy uh, yes. to their customers. Uh, what can governments do at this particular point? How can they help uh, their citizens? Yeah. I mean, there are some short-term measures and there are some also structured long-term uh, measures. In the short term, uh, many governments today providing direct or indirect uh, subsidies uh, to the rather poor segments of the population, which is uh, well understood. But I think in the uh, longer term, uh, governments need to look at the different options uh, than uh, importing gas from one major country. Today it is Russia, it could be uh, somebody else, it can be another country, 
but uh, especially Russia has a tendency, uh, to be honest with you, uh, mixing the geopolitical ambitions and energy uh, here, uh, I see that there is a big uh, interest, growing interest to make use of renewable energies, solar, uh, wind, uh, hydropower. Uh, in some countries, they are looking at, not in Germany, but others, uh, nuclear power. For example, in France, uh, where we are, President Macron came uh, only a few weeks ago, a major nuclear renaissance uh, program. Uh, so is UK, so is United States and others. So people are looking for uh, different options rather than gas. And also, uh, uh, I would also mention that when they make these energy decisions, governments on one hand looking at the energy security, geopolitical implications, but there is other important driver of the energy policy decisions, which is climate change. Because energy is the main responsible sector for climate change, uh, governments are trying to uh, use uh, more clean energy options vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, uh, the dirty ones. Indeed, uh, climate change a big issue for yes. you, a big issue for the globe as a yes. matter of fact. Uh, um, particularly in light of the fact that energy accounts for two-thirds of total greenhouse gas. So the energy uh, sector is a main, is a central yeah. player here in the efforts to reduce emissions and combat climate change. And you yourself, of course, have spoken yes. extensively about the need to reduce the supply and demand for fossil fuels. Yes. Uh, nevertheless, if we're looking at the numbers, Fatih Birol, uh, CO2 emissions have actually increased exactly. by more than 4% exactly. last year. That's the largest single increase in a decade. Are we heading in the wrong direction, or is this just a short-term pandemic-related yeah. delay? A very good question. So, uh, in Glasgow, there was a major uh, a meeting of the uh, world leaders uh, only a few months ago. This is a climate summit. All the world leaders came, and more than 100 countries commit themselves to reduce the emissions because this planet belongs to all of us. It, is not, it doesn't belong to France, nothing to China or US or Turkey or Argentina, all of us. So more than 100 countries said, we are going to reduce our emissions, commit themselves. But when you look at the numbers, as you stated, our numbers, the development is exactly the opposite direction. The emissions are increasing. Commitments to reduce the emissions are also increasing. So there is a growing gap between the rhetoric and what is happening in the uh, real life. We are, uh, as of uh, this year, we are going to uh, announce country by country what they said and what happened and to make it publicly uh, known. I think uh, many countries are not getting good marks from that uh, major advanced economies. And here, of course, I have to uh, differentiate the the major economies, advanced economies, and also uh, the developing countries as well. Yeah, indeed. You said there is a gap between the rhetoric and the actions, actually, exactly. the, the decisions exactly. being implemented. COP26, of course, exactly. in Glasgow, a lot of the announcements were made, a lot of pledges, a lot of uh, promises yes. to bring clean energy uh, to all uh, yes. within a short amount of time to bring CO2 emissions to net zero exactly. by 2015. It's very clear that the world here needs leadership on climate change. Yes. Uh, who's leading? I think in terms of uh, uh, countries, there are leaders on the advanced economies, but there are also leaders on the emerging uh, countries. For example, India is making major, major achievements. When you look at India, in terms of solar energy, they are running a big, big, big game, and uh, one after another, they are breaking records. Also, we are seeing in Europe, many European countries are doing a good job. United States are trying to catch up, and China, uh, also one of the leaders of the clean energy in terms of electric cars, in terms of uh, solar, uh, wind, uh, others. So uh, globally, if you look at uh, globally, we are seeing that the wild fossil fuels, oil, gas, and uh, coal dominate the game for the time being, we are seeing a new clean energy system is also emerging. Solar, wind, electric cars, hydrogen, nuclear, they're also uh, uh, coming uh, slowly in the picture.
So at least on paper, most, if not all, countries agree that something needs exactly. to be done exactly. here. But interestingly enough, some are blaming the high prices, gas and oil prices, on the green energy transition. They're saying the phasing out of coal has driven up uh, the need for natural gas. So do governments at this particular point need to carefully more balance the green transition with affordability and energy security? It's a delicate act, isn't it? It's another good question. So we have uh, two big jobs today. One is to have a secure and affordable cheap energy. But at the same time, we have to have a livable planet to address the climate change issue. So there will be a transition from the fossil fuels to clean energy. And this transition will not be easy. It needs to be well managed by the governments. If it is not well managed, we will see a lot of volatility in the prices. The, as we see here, a lot of uh, high price uh, uh, periods. So uh, it will not be easy. It will not be a rose garden, to be honest with you. Uh, and the, if we have a good government or bad government, we will understand from the way how they are managing to transition from the dirty, fossil fuel dominated, risky energy system what we have today to a cleaner and safer energy system tomorrow. So this will be the government's job. Yeah, absolutely. So a careful balance between the green transition exactly. and providing affordable and uh, secure energy is certainly not an easy feat by any yeah. stretch of the imagination. We talked about supply and demand yes. uh, in the very beginning with gas and oil prices are surging. Uh, yet uh, OPEC and its allies appear in no rush to increase outputs. Uh, what's your opinion here? What needs to be done? Yeah, it is uh, one of the reasons why we are seeing high oil prices, which is affecting the economies of uh, many countries, uh, because uh, many countries' uh, exports and imports, when you look at the balance, high uh, oil prices play a negative role in many oil importing countries, especially developing countries in Asia, in Africa, and in Latin America. And the, the key reason here is that the OPEC countries said we are going to increase the production by 400,000 barrels per day, a significant amount, which they can easily do. But again here, what they said they would do and what they are doing, there is a big gap. They are not able to keep up their promises and there is enough oil in their fields, but they are not bringing it to the markets and as a result, we are seeing high oil prices, which is, uh, I think, uh, bringing the global economy in a danger zone with these prices close to $100 uh, today. And uh, the IEA, speaking of a delicate matter and a balancing act, uh, you have advocated for a quick transition towards cleaner fuels, yet in recent days, and here too, if I understand correctly, you've been calling on major oil producers to increase their outputs. How do you reconcile these two opposing demands? Yeah. So they have enough oil today in their fields, and the the global uh, oil demand is so high this year, again, coming back uh, from uh, the laws of the COVID times, and this demand had to be met. And this is, they are the producers here, they have oil. If they want to have a comfortable oil markets, which they say they want it, then they will have to bring this uh, oil uh, to the markets, to comfort the markets and have reasonable uh, plausible uh, oil price levels, which is a good news for the global economy. And in my view, these very high prices are not good news even for the producers themselves because it also provides an incentive for the consumers to look at the alternatives. For example, in the, when we look at the electric car sales today around the world, this year we are seeing the record sales of electric cars. We have never seen uh, such a high amount of electric car uh, sales. One of the reasons for this is the people look, the oil prices are so high, and I go to, uh, I buy a car, which may be a bit more expensive than the traditional cars, but it is not linked to diesel or gasoline prices, which is driven by the OPEC producers. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, I, I think the situation is clear what needs to be done here. But the IEA has certainly advocated against new oil investments. Uh, but at the end of the day, the fiscal strain being caused by high fuel costs, especially on emerging economies, is limiting their ability, again, to invest in cleaner Technology is a bit of a vicious cycle yeah. here. Should the same yardstick apply to all countries, considering the fact that it's only a handful 
of advanced economies really that are responsible for the vast uh, emissions, the global emissions. Yeah. So global emissions, the climate change we have today, it is not an issue of today. It is a since hundred years, UK, United States, I don't know, European countries, while they were going to industrial revolution, they use a lot of coal and put a lot of carbon in the atmosphere. It is an accumulation of the carbon in the atmosphere. And now uh, we uh, have to minimize or reduce that uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And the, the biggest uh, part of the problem uh, is on the shoulders of the advanced economies. For example, Africa. Africa is a huge continent. Uh, and in Af Africa's share in the problem, entire climate change problems, less than 2%. But climate change will affect Africa the most in terms of droughts, in terms of the typhoons, in terms of other uh, uh, problems. So if we uh, want to find a solution to climate change, the, the big chunk of the burden should uh, be taken care of by the rich advanced economies and help the uh, developing countries to uh, uh, push clean energy in their systems as well as at home, advanced uh, economies uh, need to uh, make most of the clean energy options. So there is a need for huge amount of investments for clean energy. And I believe in the rich countries, clean energy options and the capital will meet. But it will be very difficult in Africa, Asia or Latin America here. There is a need for the advanced economies to support those economies. You've already alluded to the negative impact that the pandemic yes. has had on the energy sector. Certainly the lockdowns, the repeated uh, lockdowns yeah. were devastating. And so the number of people without access to electricity have actually risen during the pandemic. And you've spoken about the need yeah. that more energy diversification is needed. Do you see a risk out there that energy security can not be provided by some emerging economies? At least we're seeing increased power cuts. Um, do you think that energy security uh, is at risk, that we can uh, realistically run out of gas here? Yeah? <laughs> in some countries, yes, you are right. In some countries, uh, we have to uh, make sure that the uh, energy demand is met by the supply and bringing energy there. But there are some countries, for example, we talk about Africa. In Africa, can you believe it? 50%, every second person doesn't have electricity at all. And Africa is the uh, continent where you have the biggest amount of solar potential, huge solar potential. And it's very cheap. I'm the, just let me give you an example. Tomorrow I go to Belgium. Okay? The, um, uh, think about Belgium in the uh, world map, how big Belgium is, and the entire African continent. The amount of uh, electricity Belgium produces from solar is more than entire African continent. Look at the sizes of the, uh, the, these two regions and the amount of solar Belgium gets and the Africa gets. It is uh, really, if I may, it is really, in quote, it's criminal. This is amazing. And the, again, uh, every second person doesn't have access to electricity in Africa. And it's a shame. It's a shame and because electricity means you can uh, uh, have access uh, to internet, you can have light at night, and uh, you can have access to social life. So this is the, uh, one of the reasons why the Africa is still underdeveloped because they don't, they don't have uh, energy sources. You've clearly uh, spoken about the volatile energy markets yes. and that you foresee that uh, we probably have to live with these high prices. Yes for some time uh, to come here, Ukraine, Russia, that's an issue that's going to be yes, with us, it yes. seems, for some time. There's a bit of a silver lining here out there because it seems that a new Iran nuclear deal now yeah. seems actually uh, feasible. Can Iran's re-entry into the mix significantly uh, or substantially drive down energy prices? Is that a positive factor uh, here? I definitely think so. Uh, Iran can easily uh, bring uh, one 1 1.5 million barrels of oil to the markets when the sanctions are lifted. This will provide a significant comfort to the oil uh, markets and this will be definitely good news uh, for the uh, oil prices coming down and uh, providing uh, some uh, comfort to the uh, 
uh, global economy. But we are, of course, looking forward to see that this, uh, the negotiations between Iran and international community uh, is finalized in a successful manner. Rising oil prices, geopolitical uncertainties, climate change, a lot of uh, on your plate here. Yeah. Um, looking into the future, of course, uh, you are a very, very influential voice here. Time magazine has named you one of the most hundred influential person in the world. Your opinion matters uh, yes. in this field. Are you optimistic about the future? Do you think that we will be able, perhaps with the help of digitalization and AI, create a cleaner and more sustainable energy system and world out there? Very much so, because uh, here my optimism comes from the numbers. I am a man who makes his hands dirty with data. I look every day, thousands of uh, data, what's happening in the world. I see that the clean energy, new energy is coming very strongly. It is the solar, it is the wind, it is hydropower, it is the, as you mentioned, digitalization, efficiency, the hydrogen, new nuclear and electric cars. It is coming very strongly and uh, the future belongs to uh, clean energy. As I said, it will not be easy. It will be a bumpy road, but uh, the, we will see a clean energy future in the in next years to come. And here uh, I trust the uh, younger generations. They are very much uh, having the ownership of the clean energy and thanks to their efforts uh, we are going to see uh, clean energy will dominate the global energy system in the next years to come. As such, I am uh, very optimistic. Fatih Birol, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.